lies a mysterious and forbidding land, little known to most of us because access has been restricted for a very long time. It's a land of rugged, diverse landscapes, eternally snow-peaked mountains, tundra, jagged coastlines, a land of austere beauty that has captivated the few who have ventured there. survival of its inhabitants hinges entirely on the relationship they maintain with the spirits of the sea and of the mountains. These men are the Koryaks, and their homeland is on the Kamchatka Peninsula in the far southeastern reaches of Siberia, at the edge of the world, its shores washed by the Bering Sea, the Pacific Ocean, and the Sea of Okhotsk. The Koryaks occupy northern Kamchatka. They are reindeer breeders, fishermen, and hunters of marine animals. forcefully integrated into Soviet society. They were forbidden to use their native language or practice their cultural and religious beliefs. They were alienated from their own culture and their own land. Since Perestroika, the young intelligentsia have been attempting to revive Koryak traditions and rituals that had been banned for many years. This film, shot in 1992 in the village of Karaga, depicts the autumn festival of the Kololo, an annual offering of thanks to all the spirits of nature for their benevolence during the preceding year. The masked ball, vilifying the evil spirit Uliaut, is the high point of the celebration. Act One, The Harvest. The 40-day celebration of the Kololo Festival begins with the harvest, traditionally the women's responsibility. An hallucinogenic extract derived from the poisonous mushroom fly agaric plays a pivotal role in the festival activities. Those who have learned to read the tundra as well as the koryaks can find many sources of sustenance, like wild lilies, saxifrage, sorrel, and sedge. These epilogues, also called bay leaves, eaten along with meat or fish, comprise the basic diet. <laughs> Edible roots are a very rich source of starch, and the tundra is lush with berries like these blueberries, and red and black cranberries from the marshlands. <laughs> Act 2, Salmon Fishing. 
From June through August, all the fish caught by the men of Kavaga must be turned over to the Kolkos, the Russian collective farm. From September, they're allowed to keep their entire catch. Roman has been given the honor of supplying the salmon that will be offered to the spirits of nature on the opening day of the festival. It was forbidden for us to follow our customary lifestyle. We remember how to hunt. Of course, we all know how to fish. We want to learn the tradition of hunting skills. On average, each family catches about 200 kilograms of fish. Enough food for them to survive the long, harsh winter that lasts from September through May, when the temperature sometimes drops to minus 60 degrees. After the fish have been cleaned, they're set out to dry in the sun for a week, and then hung in a smokehouse for three days. The smoked fish are stored in sheds raised above the snow line so they'll be accessible throughout the winter. In the past, the storage sheds would have been filled early in the season. Kamchatka was once the largest salmon spawning ground in the world, but today the fish are not as numerous. In summer villages like this one, the Koryak stockpile the provisions they will need for the winter months, just as their ancestors had done before them. Act three, the bear hunt. The Koryaks are certain the grizzly bear is the incarnation of the mountain spirit. Thus, it will be treated as the guest of honor at the Kololo festival. Moreover, they're convinced that they're going out not to hunt the animal, but rather to invite it to the festivities. The abundant berries and edible plants attract numerous bears into the tundra. It isn't long before the men spot their tracks. Pitya, the youngest hunter, decides to follow them. Kolya, a more experienced hunter, prefers to try to outflank the animal. He knows how fast a bear can run and that it's next to impossible to outpace it. Many people of the Far East view the bear as something of a mystical creature, an animal, but not really an animal, and don't have a specific name for it. They refer to it as father, uncle, spirit of the forest, or even the old man clothed in fur. The bear was probably startled by a sound and fled. The hunt is over for today. The hunt will actually go on for a week, but in vain. Despite all their efforts, this year, Petya Kolya and the others will not manage to invite the spirit of the mountain to the festival. Act four, the seal hunt. If the spirit of the mountain is incarnating the bear, then the seal must embody the spirit of the sea. Therefore, it seems proper to invite him to the feast. Yakov is the only one who knows how to hunt seals in the traditional way. Long ago, we would leave the summer village early, as soon as the birds began to sing. We went to the low tide and set our net in the estuary channel. Later, we would come back and pull the end, closing up the net like a sand, like when we fish for toothed smelt. If a seal was caught in the net, we would kill it with a harpoon. Like this. He said that long ago, our men could whirl the harpoons a long way. 
70 метров. Прошарь. Вот это да. For the first time in 50 years, a net will be used in a seal hunt. Yakov will lead the 30-man hunting expedition. The men who will set the net in the channel are dressed in light-colored clothing. They believe this camouflage convinces the seals they're really seagulls and won't harm them. They must remain absolutely silent. The success of the hunt depends on how rapidly they can close off the channel before the seals are aware of what's happening. Something has alarmed the seals. The men must now hurry to tighten the net. The seals have been caught in the trap. All the men need to do now is to stop them. Misha, иди туда дальше на тот перешеек закрой. The harpoons also act as floats and prevent the seals from diving and escaping. Hunters could capture between 80 and 150 seals in this manner. Even on a bad hunting day, they would still bring home at least 50. Today they've been hunting for three hours, but they've managed to trap only two seals. Seals provide the Koryaks with just about all their basic needs. Meat, fat, lamp oil, and skins for clothing and canoes. The hunt is also a rite of passage into adulthood. Since the seal, like the bear, has always been something more than just an animal to the Koryaks. They never butcher or carve up the seal. They are merely undressing it. <laughs> the women join the men in the celebration. The purpose of the feast is to welcome the spirit of the sea and give thanks to him. The seal's head is impaled on a stick and anointed with sacred herbs before being roasted. Meanwhile, the men finish undressing the carcass. Only the gallbladder and bones are discarded. The lower jaw is removed from the head and sprinkled with sacred herbs. Then it's filled with food obtained from the tundra, food that the seal, a sea-living creature, has never had the opportunity to taste. According to the Koryaks, seals have always wanted to taste these foods, but never had the chance before. They also give it a taste of fresh water. A final prayer is offered. Mr. Seal, we are giving you a final prayer. Next year, come back to us and be sure to be your friends. The men gather to thank the spirits of nature. 
branches of hanging seal's hide are tied into bundles, sprinkled with sacred herbs, fat and meat from the animal, and then thrown into the fire as an offering to the spirit of the sea. The same ritual is then repeated for the spirit of the mountain. At this time, the positions of the men, the seals hide, and even the chapters, rushing for heights, change. No one knows exactly what It isn't unusual for ancestral rites like this to be performed out of habit, long after their meanings have been lost in antiquity. The shaman. The kololo begins today. And Popov is the shaman picked to conduct the rituals. One of the camera crew, Philip, has broken a toe, and Popov is called upon to heal it. The truth is, this is Popov's premier performance. Actually, he's a garage mechanic. His instructions in shamanism were not passed down from his father or from an elderly shaman. Few shamans survived Stalin's repressive regime. Much of his knowledge was gleaned from books written by ethnologists in the early 1900s and from films of the same period. The shaman is the intermediary between man and the spirit world. He is credited with possessing the power to heal the sick and the relieve pain, but the spirits are one of the ones holding the power. He merely acts as a bridge. for the ritual, and of the beat of a sacred drum, Popo falls into a trance-like state. Now his guardian spirit will possess his body, guide his actions, and speak through him. <laughs> Despite its well-known hallucinogenic effect, the fairy agaric mushroom is supposed to have medicinal properties. In any case, it's the only medication the Koryaks use. believe that a guardian spirit dwells in each person, that if that spirit somehow leaves or is dispossessed, an evil spirit will fill the void, bringing with it illness or injury. The shaman must pluck the evil spirit from Philip's broken toe and throw it into the fire. Then he must search the firmament for Philip's wandering spirit and return it to its rightful place. drum never skips a beat throughout the entire ritual. The voice of the drum is said to gain the attention of the spirits. Although Popov's ministrations were successful, he has decided on another year of study before considering himself to be a true shaman. Final act, the Feast of Kololo. The women are busy in their kitchens. Besides lots of mushroom extract mixed with blueberries, one of the Koryak's favorite dishes, they're preparing seal meat, salmon roe, and tolkusha, a mix of salmon roe, bay leaves, and berries. 
Anastasia, the doyen of the village of Caraga, is awarded the honor of performing the opening dance. Once again, the Koryaks openly celebrate the rituals they've been forbidden to practice for many years. preparing for 40 days. And now the moment has finally arrived to present their offerings to the spirit of the sea and of the mountains. Trouble, the evil spirit Ilya would suddenly burst in, inviting himself and an accomplice to join the feast. The origin and function of the masks have been lost in antiquity. Some say they represent the secret vices anchored within the hearts of men. This dance symbolizes the struggle between good and evil, for which good is to be victorious. Let's sing the tale of the young girl. The young girl waits for her sweetheart. She waits impatiently for his return. remains calm, waiting for his sweetheart to return. This song expresses the story of the Koryak people, a people who once again can return to a lifestyle stifled by 70 years of suffering. This yearning to return to nature isn't fueled simply by the desire to resurrect lost roots. There's a practical component as well. Hit by unemployment and the economic recession, the Koryaks realize they can only count on themselves to survive. With the help of the spirits, of course.